Hey, uh, uh, Greg, I don't, I don't think that's what Brett had in mind for this whole one-day announcement. All right, granule, I'll play along. I mean, it does sound pretty good. What uh what do you think your plans are, Greg? Oh, I got plans for this year. They're gonna have to get creative with it, man. They're gonna have to get creative with it. See, I don't, I don't know. I was talking to Paula, and she said you've really been enjoying this whole senior retired life. So maybe you should help out with those senior activities since, you know, you're kind of all about them already. All right, so uh, guys, what we're talking about is on October 1st, uh, the state convention is putting on the one-day uh, mission. Uh, some of you may have been a part of that last year when we had it, uh, doing events around here. Uh, we are going to take a group from here for that. Uh, Sign-up deadline is tentatively September 11th uh, if you want to sign up through us. Uh, you can also sign up through the state convention website up until September 19th. Uh, the cost is only $10. Uh, and that will cover your lunch while we're there, as well as uh, help get supplies and things like that. Uh, the rest of the cost for this mission trip is covered by our uh, missions givings that, uh, are go that go to the state convention. Uh, so it's a relatively cheap, uh, easy way for you to be involved with missions and to be able to experience that. And that's one of the things that as Christians we're commanded to do is to go out and make disciples. And this is an easy way to do it. Hot Springs isn't very far. Uh, so what we're going to do, if you plan to go and uh, come with the church, uh, you can drive yourself if you'd rather not be in a van with the rest of us. I get it, but, you know, fellowship is important, so you should suffer and ride with us. Uh, we're going to leave here probably uh, about 6 o'clock that morning. Uh, everything gets started there at about 8.30. Uh, we'll be dispersed out to the various sites uh, that you have avail ab ability to go work with. And then everything should be wrapped up at about 4 o'clock, and we'll be able to be on our way home, which will put us back here tentatively 6 to 7, unless we decide to do the Good Baptist thing and all eat together afterwards. Uh, but uh, we did mention a few of the ministry opportunities. Uh, there is going to be prayer walking. There's going to be door-to-door -door evangelism, children's activity, uh, senior adult ministry, home repair and painting. Uh, there's medical and dental options. Uh, sports activities, yard work, block parties, uh, there's a cowboy ministry, uh, car washes, laundromats, the no-sell yard sale, food distribution, and the kids' fishing derby. 
Um, when you sign up, it'll ask you to pick your top three, or you can just tell them, I will serve where needed, and they'll place you wherever is uh, needed, where people are needed the most. Uh, so Greg, after the service, is going to be out in the lobby with a sign-up sheet and information sheet. Uh, so if you have more questions or anything, you can talk to him, uh, or you can grab me, either one, uh, and we can get you signed up. I told them I didn't know how to follow that when I found out they were doing this before the scripture. So <laughs> let's stand as we read from God's word as I call to worship. Psalm 81, 1 and 2. Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout in triumph to the God of Jacob. Lift up a song. Play the tambourine, the melodious lyre, and the harp. And let's sing to the king. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation His empire shall bring. Joy to the nations when Jesus Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise, sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King For His returning We watch and we pray We will be ready With the dawn of that day And we'll join in singing With all the redeemed Cause say blessed you guys are to have me up here this morning. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh. Amen. All right. All right. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries us all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Governed, bounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him.
is in Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Amen. You may be seated. You know, it's, it's, uh, I'm grateful that you know, Bobby's been, uh, he filled in a couple weeks ago when Craig was sick. And this time, Craig's just on vacation on the beach somewhere. Uh, either way, I'm glad that Bobby's been here to help fill us in and to lead us in worship. And, and uh, as grateful as I am that Bobby's up here singing and even doing something fancy on the guitar, the greatest sound is to hear God's people singing. When you guys sing, it's just great. And I'm grateful for that, too. I hope we get back to singing here in just a little minute. Just a minute. You guys let her rip, all right? Just sing out loud and, and express to the Lord all your gratefulness are your thankfulness for all that he has done we're going to take some time this morning to worship through prayer and uh through our we're going to the scripture guide us in our prayer this morning so we're going to read this passage of scripture and then let uh, the lord guide us and to have some things we pray about in response so from second corinthians chapter four we have these uh oh, i'm sorry chapter two verses 14 and 15 the word of god says this thanks be to god who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. There is in this, behind this, the, the, there were you know, many ancient cultures, but even ancient Israel, as they worshiped in the temple, would burn incense. And that was part of the worship experience. So in this is this that you and I, as we go about our lives in Christ, we are a pleasant aroma. Your life is a sweet fragrance, not only to Christ, but to those around us as we worship Him, as we tell folks about Him, as we obey Him and live for Him. So that's part of what our prayer is this morning, is that we would be that. So if you would, join with me in praying. Bow your heads and close your eyes. And just between you and the Lord, begin your prayer this morning with this, that you would praise and worship Christ for His resurrection and the victory we have over death and the eternal life we possess. Would you pray that God would give evidence of Christ's resurrection to those around you this coming week? that your life would be proof of Jesus' resurrection. Would you pray specifically for someone that you know doesn't know Christ, that they would encounter him this week and come to faith? Would you pray for the children's ministry here at London first, that God would make his life and the gospel clear to the children, their families, and their friends. Pray that the children's ministry here would be profitable in God's eyes. Would you pray for Craig as he leads our children's ministry, the volunteers that work with him, that God would provide wisdom and effectiveness in the ministry. Heavenly Father, would you hear the prayers of your people this morning? For Lord, we know that you have 
sent Christ to us, that his death and his resurrection give us also through faith the hope of eternal life. Father, we cannot thank you enough for all that you have done for us, so we simply will, through each and every word, each and every breath we take, try to give you thanksgiving with our lives and with our songs and with our, with our obedience, with our worship. Father, would you this coming week as we work, as we interact with our families or our neighbors, would you through our lives give evidence to them of the resurrection of Christ? Lord, may we be living proof that Christ is alive. Lord, bring to our, our minds the names of those that we know do not know Jesus, have not placed their faith upon him. And we ask that even this week you would use us to bring the gospel to those that do not know you. Father, may there be people in the kingdom next Sunday that aren't there now through the work and through the witness of your people gathered in this room or listening online. Father, we pray specifically for the children's ministry here at First Baptist that as they gather together on Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings, that, Father, you would use this ministry to children to make the gospel clear to them, to their families, their moms and dads, their friends. Father, would the the ministry to children at this church be something that is seen as good and profitable in your eyes. I pray for those this morning that are leading that ministry, that you would give them wisdom and understanding and effectiveness in that ministry. And the Father, the kingdom would be eternally impacted by what happens here at First Baptist Church. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll just do it. <laughs> I'll bet you with Craig out of town this week, that was something that got forgotten. You got it? Okay, well, come on up then. <laughs> morning. Good morning. Good morning. The, the passage that Craig gave me seems quite appropriate today as we enter our new school year. This is from uh, Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Then Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do, and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went, up, went on from there. Amen. Would you stand and sing with me? Precious blood. 
be seated. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Daniel. We have been over the last few weeks working our way slowly through the first few the first couple chapters of this book. We are con going to continue to do that this morning as we are now in Daniel chapter 3. This is a story that's probably familiar to many of you. If uh, you may know this is the story of the fiery furnace or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some of you may remember Rack, Shack, and Benny from, a, from some Veggie Tales uh, not too long ago. But we're in that story this morning in Daniel chapter 3. Verses 1 to 7 is all we're going to look at this morning. I, now, I'm, I'm going to date myself here. I thought about not bringing this up, but some of you may remember an old TV show called Get Smart. Anybody, anybody remember that? Now, there was a movie a few years ago that tried to reboot that idea. Some of you may remember that. And uh, did, those of you who remember, do you remember the catchphrase of the show Get Smart? Does anybody want to try to do it? Missed it by that much and I'm not going to I'm not going to try to do the accent because it's about it just sounds bad if I try as we come to chapter three it could be said of Nebuchadnezzar that he missed it by well that much if you remember last week we saw uh, the last couple of weeks we saw Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and in that dream he had this a uh, vision of a statue, this gold, this, the top of it was gold and it was silver and bronze. And Daniel, through the work of God, gave Nebuchadnezzar this incredible war, this incredible glimpse into the future. But it appears that Nebuchadnezzar didn't quite get it. Because even though God told through Daniel, he told Nebuchadnezzar that, less, yes, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you are at the top of the statue, you are the head of gold. He didn't hear anything else. And in chapter 3, and there's every reason to believe that these events in chapters 2 and chapter 3 happen fairly close together, it appears that Nebuchadnezzar heard, ooh, I'm gold. And he built a giant golden statue as opposed to getting what God was really saying about that dream. So that's where we're going to begin this morning. Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. The satraps, prefects, and governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the harp, the, or the horn, the flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the people's nations and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning and look at this passage, would you communicate to us from these events from 2,500 years ago the truths that we need to be your people here today and this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we hear the word idolatry, we probably think about stories like this one. When we, hear the, when we hear this idea of idolatry, we probably think of some statue, some object, some picture, some image that people are bowing down to, that they give their allegiance to, that they're perhaps even making a sacrifice towards. People, by the way, have been worshiping idols for a long time. And we're going to look at that this morning, but the idea that people don't worship idols anymore is, is not true. Our idols just look differently. Uh, just a, a few weeks ago, Angel and I were watching a, a show on TV, and it was just talking about 
things, and it was, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a random show, and they were talking ab about the rise of the sneaker industry. Now, uh, one of the jobs I had in college, I worked at a sporting goods store, and I was working in the shoe department. And um, at that point in time, this will tell you when this was, the Nike Air Jordan was a relatively new shoe. That'll tell you how long ago that was. And shoes were just becoming a big deal. Do you realize that today there's actually something called Sneaker Con? It is a national convention. And all they do is sell, you guessed it, sneakers. I saw, I saw a, a little report on the sneaker con that took, took place like two or three years ago. It was in Chicago, and they were selling sneakers, tennis shoes, you know, those things you wear on your feet in the rain, for upwards of $18,000 a pair. Now, have you ever in your life thought a pair of sneakers were worth $18,000? No. I'm sorry, I don't like paying 70 bucks for a pair. We have idols today. Some of them are shaped like sneakers. <laughs> I don't get it, but you know what? I collected baseball cards when I was a kid. There are people who pay millions of dollars for baseball cards. We have things in our world and our life that we are, in fact, devoted to. From the very beginning, men like Nebuchadnezzar, and even farther back than that, we know that humanity was made. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 tell us this. Humanity, human beings, man and woman, were made in the image of God. Now, there's a whole lot to explore in that concept that we don't have time to get to this morning. But in part, it means that you and I were created, made to act, to have authority, to represent God to and be a part of this natural world, to live and to do things representing Him. That's what partially it means to be made in His image, to do things in this world in such a way that God is represented. When we moved here five and a half years ago, we owned a house in Georgia. We had to sell that house. And when we did, we designated someone who, uh, we had to go through some legal documentation, and we appointed someone legally who could show up when we did sell the house, who could show up and could sign the paperwork for us so that the world would look at it. So yes, Brett and Angela sold, sold the house, and these people signed on their behalf. They act as, as us, do what we would have done. That's how the thing takes place. Well, part of what it means to be made in the image of God is that you and I are supposed to act and represent we are created for the purpose of being God's image, doing the things he would be doing if he were here in the flesh like you and I are. We are his agents, if you will. That's part of what it means. Our, our lives, our, our actions, our words are to represent his nature, his goals, and his purposes. When Adam sinned, and Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3, they exchanged God's judgment for their own. They began to, instead of living in the, the image of God, they began to serve their own interests. He put himself in the place of God, finding security and pleasure and gratification in making himself the center of the universe and not God. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7 says that you and I have been created for the purposes and for the glory of another, namely God himself. And when Adam and Eve acted on their own against God's intentions, they misrepresented God. They denied his position as God. They elevated themselves to that role. And you know what that's called? Idolatry. That's the short word. Whether we elevate ourselves or whether we elevate something else in the place of God, that's called idolatry. And this idea begins to get at the heart of what it means to be an idol worshiper. That we deny that we are made, that we are created for the purposes of another. That we are not the center of the universe. That our, our lives are not primarily about us. And when we find ourselves devoted to something else other than God, we are denying that He is the center of all that exists. We are denying that we are created for His purposes. Romans chapter 1 verse 25 says, in describing the world in the latter days, says that humanity exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship created things rather than the creator. And by the way, idols don't just come from outside of us like what Nebuchadnezzar built here. That's the, that's the expression of it. 
idolatry, idols, come from inside of us. They begin in our very hearts. The idols that are erected out here, the statues like Nebuchadnezzar built here in Daniel chapter 3, are merely the representation, the symptom, the result of idolatry already taking place in our hearts. Idolatry, the worship of idols, is a heart condition of replacing God as the center of all things with anything else that we can come up with. Other things that our heart gravitates towards. Nebuchadnezzar built a golden statue. Maybe, it seems like it maybe have been inspired by the statue in his dream from chapter 2. Now, we don't know what the statue actually was. We don't know if it was a representation of him. We don't know if it was a representation of the Babylonian god, which was called Bel, or something else. The Bible doesn't give us this. But whatever he did, he built this idol, and he demanded that everyone worship it, bow down to it, and give to it its alleg- their, their allegiance. So idolatry as a state and a function of the heart begins with denying the Creator, denying God, denying His purposes for us, denying His place, and continues as we replace God with whatever it might be, whether it's a statue or a sneaker. Those other things begin to take our devotion. Now the struggles that led us to Daniel chapter 3 that Israel had begin and end with the idea of idolatry. We may remember that Israel finds itself in captivity in Babylon because idolatry, because they had repeatedly over hundreds of years as a nation turned their backs from God and continued to worship idols and false gods, and God had given them warning after warning. The book of Judges, well actually let's go back even further than that, I mean just weeks after Israel has been freed from slavery Egypt, they find themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai as literally Moses is up there talking to God. And what's Israel doing at the bottom? They have made and fashioned a golden calf to worship. When they eventually do get into the nation or to the to Canaan, to the promised land, and after Joshua has led them through the conquest and possession of their land, We find ourselves in a history called the era of the Judges. You see a book of the Bible called the Judges. And throughout the book of Judges, Israel goes through decade after decade, year after year of worshiping idols, enduring the punishment and the judgment of God, repenting, going back to the worship of God, and then going back to idols. Following especially the reigns of Saul and David and Solomon, Israel finds itself now a divided nation, constantly going back and forth and worshiping idols false idols, to the point that God said, stop it or else I will send the Babylonians. They did not stop, and now we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 3 with a people captured and, and defeated because God sent the Babylonians because of Israel's idolatry. And here we are in Babylon, and now we have a king raising up a statue. So Israel struggled with this all their life. So it's not just human beings Israel struggled with it as well. I asked asked myself a question. With all that Israel had seen, with all that they they had encountered, all the times God had been active in their lives, why did they find themselves drawn to idolatry? The same question could be asked of us this morning. John Calvin, who was one of the fathers of the Protestant Reformation so many centuries ago, he said of the human heart that we are, in fact, idol-producing factories. That you and I are created by God, of course, to worship God, but then in replacing you know, worshiping God, we just worship anything we can get our hands on. That we are worship, that we are idol making factories. Why is that? Well, in Israel's case, we can look at it and go, why did they find themselves so captured by, by idolatry, the worship of false gods? Well, one, if you just take if you just look at Israel's history as a people enslaved in Egypt, what were they surrounded by in Egypt constantly? idols. In fact, you can make the argument that the nation of Israel, which primarily grew within the nation of Egypt in its early history, probably knew more about the idols than they did the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so when they get out on their own for the very first time, so to speak, out there in the desert, they revert back to what they'd been surrounded by. Israel was unique in this sense. They were the only nation in that part of the world, as far as we know, that part of history in total, that worshiped one God. Everybody else Everybody else had a whole pantheon of gods. 
It was a God of this and a God of that. Gods of rivers and gods of skies and gods of thunder and gods of lightning and gods of uh, crops. And every nation had all these gods. And Israel said that we have one God. Israel also was surrounded by nations that not only had multiple gods, but they had statues and temples to all these gods. And God had told Israel, don't you dare build a statue of me. I can't be represented that way. And so Israel was unique. Israel found themselves surrounded by a world and cultures. Everybody had statues. Everybody had idols. Everybody had multiple gods. And they were unique. And you and I know it's hard to be the only one of anything, isn't it? It's hard to be the only person like you. It's hard to be the only person that holds to a unique set of beliefs when no one else around you does that. It's difficult. And so Israel found themselves surrounded by people who worshiped idols. And by the way, here's another reason I think they had trouble with that. Idolatry, it's easier. You know what's different about all these idols, all these false religions that Israel found themselves surrounded by? When God made a covenant with Israel, he told them, you will not, you will not have other gods, you will not make idols, you will not make any representations of me. And on top of that, he says, I'm going to give you some laws. I'm going to give you some things that will guide the way you live. And these are things I expect of you as my people. You know what all those false gods around Israel did? Not a thing. It's easy to show up however often you're false god. If you're Egyptian, if you're Canaanite, if you're Philistines, if you're the Amorites, it's easy to show up every once in a while do your little religious ritual, whatever it might be, and then go on about your life with no demands. That's not what God set up. God said this. He said, I have this life I want you to live to make you uniquely mine, a, a life that you will live that will represent, God said, my holiness. That's hard. Showing up once a week and doing your bit, that's easy. By the way, do, do you see this, you know, if today we claim the name of Christ and all Christianity is simply showing up once a week for a little ritual, do you see how that looks a whole lot like ancient Egyptian or ancient Roman or ancient Philistines? Idolatry is easy. So why not do it? If I can pray to the God of this and he gives me a bumper crop, if I can pray to that God over there every once in a while and he gives me kids, why wouldn't I do that without all the demands that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would make? So yeah, idolatry is easy. It's, everyone else does it. And sometimes it even looks like it works. I mean, the reality is most people, even back then, they're going to get married, they're going to have kids, they're going to farm, they're going to do all these things. And because God's gracious, because God gives His gifts to all throughout the Scripture, we know that, that God provides food for most people through the, the natural cycles of the world. If they, if they believed in whatever God they believed in, they made their little sacrifice and they got married and they had kids. Oh, it worked because I prayed to such and such God. So sometimes it even looks like it works. So it's easy. Everyone else does it. And sometimes it even looks like it works. So why not do that? And people of Israel found themselves struggling with that all the time. And the truth is, you and I probably do as well, without even realizing it. Sometimes we are surrounded by the world and the culture and the things that this, this world expects of us. And we're the only ones who think we believe what we believe. There's, it's hard to believe in the God of Scripture today. It's easier to do other things. It's easier to rely and depend upon other things for success or for profitability or for whatever we want to achieve in life. It's easier to do those things. They don't demand of us what God does. And sometimes it even appears that those things work for a while. So why not do that? Well, Israel struggled with all that. And so because of that, they found themselves, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they find themselves in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, and now he has built a statue, and he expects them to worship it under the threat of death. Now, idolatry goes back in human history from the very beginning. Israel struggled with it from the very beginning. And we may think to ourselves, well, what's, the, what's really the big deal here? What can even me accidentally flirting with idolatry today, what's the real danger? I don't mean for it to be a big deal. 
I want to take you very quickly to Psalm 115. Psalm 115 gives us a warning about the effects of idolatry. And they're much more subtle or much more pervasive than we might give them credit for. We might think, okay, well, we know we shouldn't worship anything other than God himself. But even beyond that, there is a real danger. Psalm 115, I'm going to begin reading the very beginning. It begins like this, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Because of your loving kindness, because of your truth, why should the nations say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them, catch this, those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. You know what the danger, one of the dangers of, of idolatry is? That we will become like what it is we're devoted to. These nations around Israel are worshiping idols that they made with their own hands. And these representations, like the, like the image that Nebuchadnezzar put up here in, ta- in Daniel 3, they had eyes and they had ears and they had hands. They had all these things. But just because they had eyes, does that mean that they can see? No. Just because they had a mouth, they can't speak. Of course not. And the point here is this. When we worship an idol, we become like the thing that we're worshiping. Which means that we all of a sudden we lose our ability to hear. We lose our ability to see. We lose our ability to speak. We become hollow on the inside. We become shells. We become lifeless. When we worship lifeless things, we become lifeless. When we worship things that cannot speak, the things that cannot hear, we lose the ability to perceive and understand truth. Even today, when you and I might accidentally find ourselves worshiping something other than God, we are, at that point, harming our ability to understand and to know the truth of who God is. Whether it's sneakers, whether it's the, the newest car out there, you fill in the blank. That I, I could list you know, an infinitely long list of things that we sometimes devote ourselves to, we will become like those things, lifeless, hollow, meaningless, unable to understand and to perceive or to even speak things that are true. When we place our security, our devotion to anything, when we place our hopes in a philosophy or an idea, we exchange the truth of God for a lie. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar has done. He has heard the truth of God through the dream of chapter 2, and yet he has set up an idol and has denied it. If we were to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, you would see the story of the Tower of Babel. And in that story, there is a key verse that kind of initiates God's activity at the Tower of Babel where he kind of scatters them all and defeats them. And it's this, that the the builders of the Tower of Babel said this, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. They made themselves their idol. They made themselves the center of the universe. They wanted themselves to receive credit. They wanted the world to revolve around them, if you will. They made their own comfort, their own success, their own fame, their own pleasure the most important thing to them. And by the way, we may not have idols in the sense of Nebuchadnezzar here in Daniel chapter 3, but if we have idols, there's where it's at. For so many of us, even who claim the name of Christ, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves structuring our daily routines. We can even find ourselves structuring our faith in God around ourselves. What can God do for me to make me happy? What can God do for me that will make me comfortable? What can God do for me that will entertain me, that will give me what I want? The moment we are approaching God in that way, we are already guilty of idolatry. Because we have made ourselves for our purposes. We have made God to suit our purposes and not us to suit His. And that is idolatry. Ever since Adam and Eve ate that forbidden tree, ate that tree fruit of that forbidden tree, 
people have wanted to be their own gods. Independent of Him, wise in their own eyes. And we've been enslaved by that inclination. So how do we, and we're going to get to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their response to this next week, I promise you. <laughs> we're going to get to them next week. But how do we begin to defeat this tendency towards idolatry? Well, remember, at the heart of idolatry is this idea that I want to replace God as the center. I want to replace Him with myself or my comfort or some, whatever it might be. I want to replace God with something else. So how do we begin to do that? Let me suggest that one way we begin to do that is through worship. Proper worship. Worship that God is at the center of, not ourselves. I've told this story a couple times just because it's, it's so, it's, it's, it's just funny, it's sad, but it's, it's funny. I was, I, was a, I was serving as a music minister uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was, and I had a lady in the church who... Um, wanted to sing different songs that we were sometimes singing. And she made the comment to me, we're at a high school football game. Um, and she, she comes up to me at, at the football game and says, um, there are some songs that we're not singing that I'd like us to sing. And she goes, here's my list. Here, here's, what, here's what I want us to sing on a Sunday morning. And there were some songs that, quite frankly, we just weren't going to sing. The, the, the doctrine in them was not very good. And she said, well, I, I, I pay a tithe. Don't I get to pick out some songs? I was like, um, that's not the way this works. Her idea was this. I gave God this, I get, then he does what I want him to do. That was her approach to faith. That is idolatry. The church and God were there to serve her, not her to serve him. When we approach worship that way, we're in trouble. But if we would, real worship is this idea that I approach God on his terms, glorifying him, telling the truth in what I do, living lives, uh, or living a, a worship that speaks the truth of God's Word to Him and to one another. True worship gathers our attention not on ourselves, but on Him. If my attention on worship is how I feel, I am not worshiping. But if my attention is upon who God is and what He has said and what He has done, that's worship. So true worship will focus my mind on who God is and what He has done. It will draw my attention to Him and not to myself. Secondly, living lives that are other-centered. I want to take you very quickly to Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, as Paul is writing this letter to the church there in Colossae, he has earlier in the, in the chapter told them that they need to move away from certain things. And in particular, in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says this, Consider, therefore, the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, and passion, and evil desire, and greed, which amount to idolatry. So Paul is listing this whole list of things that amount to idolatry. Now, later on in the chapter, he says this, As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgive you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. You want to know how to defeat modern idolatry? Let me just sum it up this way. Love the people around you as God has loved you. We could probably sum these things up we could probably sum up these two ways of defeating idolatry this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. You do those things that draws your attention away from your own priorities. It draws your attention away from your own comfort. It makes you no longer the center of your universe and puts everyone else there. And that will begin to defeat idolatry. So here's the invite this morning as we look at what Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar took God's word to him through the dream and through Daniel's interpretation of that dream. Nebuchadnezzar took that, missed it by that much, 
built a statue, demanded worship of the statue. He missed God's word entirely, and he made himself. I, I still think this is what happened. He had that dream, and Daniel told him, God says that that dream, that there's four medals here, and Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. I don't know that Nebuchadnezzar heard anything past that. I'm the head of gold. God made me gold, and he put up an image of gold. He missed it. He took God's word and made it about himself, Nebuchadnezzar did. And so by chapter 3, he's engaging in idolatry because he thought God, he thought he was the center of the universe and not God. He missed the point. So here's the invite. To move away from the things that would center your life on yourself. Those things which are described in Colossians chapter 3 which I just read portions of to you, to center your life instead on loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. To instead focus your life upon loving those around you as yourself. This sounds a whole lot like kind of our theme verse here at First Baptist, 2 Corinthians 5.15. Preached on this a few weeks ago, a couple months ago. He, Christ, died for all, so that they who live, that's us, might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. That's the invitation this morning. To recognize that our own hearts, even sometimes as Christians, can produce idols. Knowing that. To worship, to love the Lord our God, and to love one another to take our attention away from those, uh, from, from ourselves, from anything we might use to put, to replace who God is, so that we will move away from being deaf and dumb and lifeless, and we will find ourselves becoming like Christ, whom we worship. You worship an idol, you become like the idol. You worship Christ, guess who you become like? Christ. That's the invitation. Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you so much for the truth you give us through your word. Lord, we confess that perhaps even this week we have found those moments when we made ourselves the center of our universe or we replaced our devotion to you with the devotion to something else. Lord, it doesn't mean that we don't care about other things doesn't mean we don't spend our resources where we need to or even have a hobby or whatnot it just simply means this what are we devoted to and father even this week we probably have found ourselves devoted to things other than you and so even as israel struggled with idolatry we probably even have this last week lord forgive us May we follow the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who refused to bow the knee, the knee, refused to devote themselves to the worship and the devotion of anything other than you and you alone. Forgive us, Lord, when our lives have not reflected who you are, have not been lived out as your image bearer. May we be a people moving forward today who live and act and speak truly in your name as your agents, as your representatives, as your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and sing as Bobby leads us in a time of worship with our hearts and our minds focused upon the Lord. If God's placed on your heart something that you want to respond to, maybe it's the confession of an idol. Maybe it's that you've never come to faith in Christ at all. Whatever it might be, I want to invite you to, if you want to come and talk, we'll talk right now. If you want to talk with Alan in the back, you can do that. Maybe you want to pray where you are, maybe you want to pray up here. Whatever it is, you respond as we now worship. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my 
strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you desire and I long to worship thee. Amen. Just a couple of quick things this morning before we are dismissed. Uh, today's August 21st, September 18th. So I think that'd make that the third Sunday of September. About a month from now, we're going to have a church-wide fellowship. We're going to use the backyard and have a picnic out back, all right? So church-wide fellowship, church picnic out in the back. Um, I think we are providing uh, the meat. Like, I think we're going, we're, going, we're going to grill out burgers and such. All right? So this is going to be a cool church. We're going to get a couple of grills out here. We're going to grill burgers. We're going to sit back here and have a good time. Sunday night, 5 o'clock on September 18th. Uh, we'll get you some more details, but go ahead and put that on the calendar. It, that's uh, about a month from now. Uh, also, I mentioned we prayed for the children's ministry a little bit earlier on this morning. One thing we want to do, we haven't done since before COVID, and as we want to get our van ministry on Wednesday night started back up and, and picking up kids. We used to pick up about 10, 15 kids on a Wednesday night, and we want to get that thing back up and rolling. We need van drivers, though. And so if you would be interested in, in talking to us about being a van driver, that probably means being up here by about 5.15 and picking up kids and getting them up here by between 6 and 6.15 uh, on, a, on Wednesday nights. And maybe being part of a rotation or even getting those kids back sometimes. Uh, we have... All those things are wide open, but we would love, we think God wants us to get that van ministry up and running again. If you'd be interested in doing that, would you talk to me or talk to Craig? Now, Craig's on vacation. He's in Florida right now, but he'll be back on Wednesday. So you can talk to him or talk to me between now and then, and we will, well, don't, yeah, don't, don't give Craig a call right now. Just wait till Thursday, give Craig a call, and he, I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Uh, talk to him next week, and we'll get you up and running on that. And, of course, you already heard Greg and, and Nick talk about one day. You know, a year ago, the state of Arkansas came here for their one-day ministry. We had multiple events, and everyone came here from around the state. This time, it's our turn to go somewhere else. And so there's all different kinds of opportunities. Greg is going to be out in the foyer here in just a moment. There's all different kinds of things for you to sign up for, uh, from prayer walking to, to food distribution, all the different things we did even last year, no sale, yard sale. Um, sign up in the foyer on your way out this morning. That's the first, Sunday, first Saturday of October, October 1st, so that should be easy to remember. And we'll be going to one day in that. All right. Is there anything else I'm missing right now? It's okay. Cool. We're going to be dismissed this morning with this from Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. This will be our, our benediction, if you will. May the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another in Christ Jesus. And with that, and so that you may be in one accord with one voice to glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're dismissed.